Now, the working title for this video game was Aquabatics and the Official Aquabatic Games. And official is spelled O W F I S H A L. So there's a usual James Bond jokes in the titles there, like Robocard, the most popular one. The second one's called uh, James Bond Ro Operation Robocard or something. Yeah, we'll get to that. <clears throat> now. Now, this series, the whole series was sponsored, as it is a very British video game series, it was sponsored in the UK by the line of biscuits known as uh, Penguin by McVitie's. Shut your eyes, open your mouth. Chocolate Penguin, trust McDonald's to bake the best biscuits. That's, that's baked, by the way. So is this, this is also baked. Shut your eyes, open your mouth. Is it open your mouth or shut your eyes? Grandpa opening his mouth, think it's a sneakers. Boom, it's a penguin in your mouth. Boom, trust McDonald's to pick the best biscuits. Like this one, shut your eyes, open your mouth, grandma. And what is that, I cannot see. Chocolate penguin, boom, in grandma's mouth. Trust McDonald's to pick the best biscuits. Only three and a half D, grandma. It's only three and a half D. Boom, dad, shut your eyes, open your mouth, chocolate penguin. And I believe that's all. We have a we have a more modern version. Uh, this is the penguin on the <clears throat> Nintendo Switch? It's an eight pack. Pick up a penguin, new bigger bar that looks giant. That looks extremely big. <laughs> Play all four hundred versions of James Bond two. I'm gonna get to that. Why not? I'm gonna get to that. But first, first we're getting to this. First Jane Pond in what I suppose is some ghetto re-release, but just some words on the left, so that's always cool. Hey Cho, hey Rio, good to see everybody. Shrapnel, what's up? You would have to ask Dan, you would have to ask a British if the penguin biscuits are any good. Penguin jokes, link some in chat. I don't have any penguin jokes. Oh we had a we had a biscuit thing in, in Italy, like um um, it's it's more of a of an ice cream thing, right? It's called cucciolone, which means big puppy, literally. Um, and its peculiarity is that it had comic books. We have a biscuit with comic books uh, stuff. Let's bring one up. So you open the pack, and it's a ice cream biscuit thing. It's shit, by the way, but super popular, and it's got comics. Where is your math? Uh, book. It went to the doctor, said it had a lot of problems. Italian biscuit ice cream jokes. But apparently, the, the penguin uh, things also did. So, this, these are British, so this is probably better or worse, depending on uh, your taste. Let's see what the joke is here. Why can penguins fly? Because they're chocolate biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> milk chocolate covered biscuit bar filled with chocolate cream milk chocolate 29 percent eh, that's not too too bad that's not too bad what's the other 71 percent though um, all right that's a biscuit it's fine it's fine thank you dan i needed that i knew i was missing something british i knew it <laughs> More jokes, please. Just link them in chat. I don't have them. I don't have any Reddit. <laughs> Atomic Runner, thank you very much for the 100 bits. Thank you, thank you for spending your hard-earned uh, Twitch bucks on, on me. All right. Everybody on me. So this is James Pond on the Water Agent. It came out in 1990 and only released for the Amiga, the Atari ST, the Acorn 32 bits, and uh, the Sega Mega Drive, which makes this... Last one, the only console version, of course. How did the penguin pass his driving test? He winged it. <laughs> Keep them coming. <laughs> I'll read them. <laughs> Shit. Alright. Then came the second game. Is the Commodore 64 cover. It's the same as the Amiga one, anyway. Uh, this is the most popular one. This game was crazy widespread. This is codenamed Robocod. James Pond 2, codename Robocod. 
had a way more widespread release than the other game, of course. Originally a 1991 Amiga video game, it was ported to multiple generations and even handheld systems, ranging from the Game Boy to the Switch, and from the Amiga to the PlayStation 3. This, this video game made it to the Switch. Talking about uh, an old British video game, and it, it made it to, to the Nintendo Switch, of course, is what we're saying. All right. So, after that, in 1993, a rather simple product with a very potent name was released on the Amiga. We're talking, of course, of the game at hand. Talking about the aquatic games starring James Bond and the Aquabats. Look at that. The wildest sports game ever. Ever. Now, this video game was conceived to break the fans' weight for the new and final James Bond game, for James Bond 3, which was to be delayed. This little video game is not the usual platforming video game, but it has instead a wet Olympics minigame setting. This third title was also ported to the Super Nintendo. There's a, here's a, here's a box. How did the penguin pass his driving test? He winged it. Oh, no, that's, that's an old one. Here's a new one. What type of pasta do penguins eat? Pinguini. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm laughing. I can't deny it. it was good because I'm laughing. I can't deny it. <laughs> it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Hey, Carl. I don't know, this cover art, I know, right? What the, it's, it's peculiar, it's peculiar. It's, uh, it's a cover art, diggy. It's the wildest sports game ever for boys and girls of all ages. What about grown, hot men like you? At any rate, let's move on with the series with the final game, the fourth in the series. This is James Pond 3 Operation Starfish, came out in 1993. It would only be released on Amiga, Amiga CD32, Mega Drive, Super Nintendo, and Game Gear, interestingly. I'd be curious to check that out. I haven't. Peculiar means shit in Italian. <laughs> That's not true. Hey, Anne, what's going on? <laughs> uh, why does James Pond look like fucking bootleg Super Frog? Hmm. We might find some tie-in to what you said later. We'll find it. <laughs> All right. Now, for better or worse, this one uh, here, the third one, it lost some distinctive gameplay traits of the other standard titles I've read, like the ability to look around the map. Uh, the first game was divided in missions, the third one had nothing of that, so maybe it was the most standard one. But I believe we're missing some pretty good jokes here. Like how the game is called Operation Starfish and it's spelled with a five. That's, that's flying over my head, by the way. But I think you might have to do with some James Bond reference. James Bond reference includes free. Uh, fish secret agent pack worth 10 pounds almost oh, what does it say over there let me check that out check this out one of the best arcade games ever released for the amiga <laughs> the conception that um i don't know like in the mid 90s the conception that games that stay true to just being platformers or i don't know standard games and not like trying to reinvent the wheel or arcade games um or just because it has core maybe i don't really know what um, the thought process is there that me i fire what is that i wouldn't know i wouldn't know i believe there was some good text here too a brilliant arcade adventure with loads of laughs go and dive in go on dive in Characters are beautifully animated, superb, a thoroughly enjoyable game. All right, I'll I'll take your word on that screenshot. Now, the spin-off, the spin-off that we're we're playing this one later, uh, is the last game on the Amiga A five hundred starring James Bond. 
Because like the last one came came on the later uh, fucking range. The A1232 bit Amiga range. The AGA1 Operation Starfish. Of course we're playing it on Mega Drive, but just gonna mention it. Just gonna throw it there. Now, let's talk about the developers. British Security Service. Oh, oh okay. MI5 is a British security service. Okay, so that's the joke we're using 5 in Starfish. Hmm. I see. James Bond 3, I always struck Jiggy as the best one. Okay. I, they're all on the Mega Drive, you know? They're, they're all ported to the Mega Drive. So, um, if I don't die of old age first, I'll, I'll, I'll get them. I'll get to it for, for sure. Um, in order, by the way, so I guess I was supposed to play the first one first. It doesn't matter. I'm playing this now. Now, the Aquatic Games Amiga original is strictly credited to Vector Dean, but the other console versions also include uh, Millennium. So, Vector Dean was active as early as uh, 1898, 1880, uh, 1989, sorry, 1989, of course. Move your dick aside and strap in because we're gonna look at a bunch of good old video games right now. Now, the first game they put out is Bad Company. Look at this. Now, this is a greedy Space Harrier inspired video game. It was a four man job with David Whitaker music. Look at this. Look at this character selection screen that alone makes you want to play the video game unless you're one of those. Uh, Oh, senpai, yamite, kind of dudes that just have to play anime video games and that's it. Look at this shit, look how good this is. And this, look at the title screen, Bad Company, by literally four dudes. Now it says from Logotron Entertainment. It might look like it says from Logotron Entertainment. And it does. I will get to it, we'll get to it. Here's a screenshot, look, just Space Area, British, Mega Space Area, probably runs it, uh, one frame, no, no. Now, most amazingly about this game is that a budget release that came out for the Atari ST under the Pocket Power label drains all of your energy, all of your hit points at the start of the game, making it impossible not to die immediately. <laughs> now, as we say, the game does bear the Logotron uh, publishing logo there. I will get to it. It's relevant. It's relevant. But we're talking about back to Dune. I believe we are, at least. I believe we are. Now, uh, what will follow for them is James Pond Underwater Agent, so the first James Pond game, of course. But other two games I want to show you under Vector Dean's belt, aside from the other three James Pond titles, are this video game here, Fire and Brimstone, which was a three-man job this time, again with David Whittaker on the music. Here is the final boss, I suppose, of Fire and Brimstone, which is basically Satan on an ice stage. I do not think it gets any fucking bigger dick than that, guys, in any video game, to be quite honest. I mean, it's, it's full screen Satan, but it's also an ice stage and is, 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 in, a, is in an ice block. So that's, that's, that's okay, enough said. Also, they also, they also made, they also made a Rollo to the Rescue, which was a Mega Drive Genesis exclusive, which surprisingly, I have a copy by the way, which surprisingly also made it to Japan. Look at that. Zo, 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 it says. Rescue, uh, that die something. But Zozo Zo, I think it's a joke. It's a play on uh, Zo meaning elephant in, 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 in Japanese. I believe that's the joke there. Taskete Rolo. Help me roll. Yeah, Daisaksen. Okay. Which means something. It means something for sure. That's a McCall game if I've ever seen one. Okay. Uh, James Bond actually served in MI. Oh, okay, see, I'm, I'm completely James Bond ignorant. So that which just flew over my head. So that's the, the, the stuff that James Bond is serving in, which is a, the real um, a British security service, uh, secret service, whatever you want to call that stuff. 
I had no idea. Okay, Jiggy, I, I, I see. Thank you. Now, there is um, an, an ultimate, in the sense that it's the last one, uh, title that will mention for Vexodine. Apparently put out under the name of Quantum Production, which was Yolanda, the ultimate challenge. See, I had another reason to call this ultimate. It's called ultimate. Yeah, that's a girl. That's a natural, real girl on the cover, guys. This is a British stream now. None of that, uh, none of that anime bullshit here. No, none of that shit here. This is a, this is a Western video game stream. None of this. Just, just gonna be hot women on the cover not um not animes where's the anime there's no anime it's hot women look at that debatable but s hunter welcome very much <laughs> you're very welcome with that nickname s hunter <laughs> whatever kind of hat ass you might um in my favor Okay, so this is Yolanda. Um, this this is a curious one because this is a sixteen bit Amiga sequel to an eight bit game called Hercules. All right, so this is Yolanda. Pretty good title screen. It looks something like this. It's kind of a little little challenges, and it's a sequel to this. It's a sequel to Hercules. It's, it's odd because Moby Games stacks them on the same page. That's super odd, but it's, it's a sequel. It's just 100% a sequel. I, I, saw, I saw multiple people streaming Yolanda, I think. Um, did I see you streaming Yolanda, Jiggy? I don't know. I don't know. I know I thought this was going to be the good James Pond. Hey. What do you mean? This is not a good James Bond? Are you calling a video game bad? Hey, Kun, what's going on? Alright. Now, ultimately, Vector Dean was acquired by Millennium themselves in 1994. So we have Millennium, which um, developed a bunch of games and went on under other names. Uh, here's the 90 to 92 logo. It's a 1992 logo. Here's another logo from 92 and 93. It's an exclusively a 1993 logo. 1993 exclusive. This is 95, 96. So this is Millennium, um, who acquired Vectodine. Now Vectodine made those games I mentioned, but they also kind of made like James Bond, I suppose. But Millennium, Millennium is credited for the home version, right? But they're basically the same thing, is what I'm getting to. Because in 1994, Millennium acquired Vector D. Now, Millennium was headquartered in London. Millennium Interactive LTD. And it originally formed from the looks of Logotron Entertainment. Do you remember Logotron Entertainment? They were the publishers for a game I showed you earlier. This one, from Logotron Entertainment. This one, Logotron Entertainment publisher, but developed by... Back to Dean. So it kind of all ties back together and it will keep doing so for the rest of the lore shock, which is kind of amazing. It's um, what I really like about doing this. Now, Logotron, they probably had a logo that was so good that they had to call it the whole thing just logo something because the logo is fucking holy shit. That, that's a turtle with, that's a Leonardo turtle with, it's, 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 it's very good. <laughs> it's the best company logo I've ever seen. <laughs> It's fitting too to the stream, but yeah, it's a Leonardo turtle, so it has four arms. Still has two legs. Him, so it's pretty. It's pretty sick. Okay, so Logotron Entertainment is actually Cambridge-based, a Cambridge-based team which only had releases between 1987 and 1990. So basically, from the ashes of Logotron came Millennium Interactive. Let's look briefly, like we did for Vectodine, at some uh, Logotron titles that they put out. But I should say these were only published by them. So we're not going to look too, too hard. 
they did make a game it was called uh, archer mclean's pool that's published by virgin i don't know who, the, who developed that and there's eye of horus there's quadrillion there is star goose and there is star ray or revenger of defender as it was published by epics in the states remember epics is the people behind the epics handy which is code name for the atari lynx epics of course um pretty 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 good revenge of defender i have a very bad um gameplay screen there you go very bad but it's called Revenge of Defender, I suppose you can guess what it plays like, if you know how Defender plays like. A Star Goose looks amazing. If you look at Star Goose, it looks fucking amazing. It's, it mixes like, um, seems to mix like um, top down, um, yeah, let's, let's put it up. Star Goose seems to mix top, top down um, action, shooting action with do i have a chrome yes i do where um the kind of the kind of uh 3d 3d uh old computer 3d gameplay that it reminds me of the first video game developed by paul kise paul kise the the french dude behind uh flashback most notably not another wall that was at a chahi but polky said the french dude behind um behind flashback if you go look at the lower shock you'll find something akin to this but much more primitive some gameplay akin to this so this is star goose it's another game uh published by by logotron But we're talking about a Defender, uh, no, Revenger of Defender, good title. Or, very good title, Revenger of Defender. Here's the, the Star Ray title screen, the original European name of uh, Revenger of Defender. The Florable, Leonardo Turtle, Turtle Da Vinci, exactly. Hercules shit, where you, Hercules game where you actually do shit Hercules is supposed to do. That sounds, yeah, you know, right? That could be, that could be interesting. Shrapnel says, I think that could be a reference to the logo programming language. Huh. Cool. But is there anything related to the turtle in the, the logo programming language? I've never heard of it. I, would, I wouldn't know. <laughs> All right. Oh, you did, Nico Jazz. Star Ray? Or Revenge of Defender? Cool. Really cool. Yeah, logo use turtle graphics is the cool them. Oh, nice. Star Goose. Okay, I see. Yeah, it seems really cool. It's um, the one that struck them in the most. And finally, Xor. They also published Xor. Now, none of these were actually developed by Legotron, as far as I know. And I guess the most relevant one might be. None of them, in fact. Okay. Um, hold on, hold on. Now, we will note how between 1990 and 1991, this company we were talking about, which is, of course, uh, Millennium, they moved from London to Cambridge, where it would stay through multiple name changes. Now, Cambridge was where Logotron was. So basically, they went from Cambridge to London and then back into um, into Cambridge. Now, the company, at least under that name of uh, Millennium, was mostly known for James Bond, and their titles were generally published by U.S. Gold. In 1987, they were bought by Sony, and they were renamed to SCE Studio Cambridge. Here are two logos, PlayStation One related. From 1997, that year when they were actually bought. The last game they put out as Millennium with that name was the PlayStation 1 version of Frogger. It's back. Well, this is the cover for the Windows version, but you get the idea. Whereas the first game they put out as SCE Studio Cambridge instead 
was the extremely popular PlayStation 1998 title, which most of you will recognize, Medieval. Does anybody not play this game? I tried the PSP version of this a few years ago. It was pretty shit. Controls were pretty bad. Did Millennium become Frontier Developments? No. I don't think so. But I'm getting to what they became. It became a couple more things. No, no, okay, so that's in Cambridge, too, interesting, nope. No. Yeah, this came out in 1998, and in 1999 came the second game. No. Now, 2009, the team became part of the SCE Worldwide Studios Group, and was then renamed to simply Cambridge Studios, so we're talking 2009. Talking uh, 10 years later and more after Medieval. The first title under that name would be the 2009 PSP version of Little Big Planet, which of course you all know about. Finally, in 2012, it became part of the Guerrilla BV group, right here. It was renamed to Guerrilla Cambridge, thus putting out the PS Vita Killzone Mercenary in 2013. The PlayStation 4 rigs mechanized combat league in 2016. And this is where our millennium journey ends. So that's what they become nowadays. They are Guerrilla Cambridge. They are Guerrilla Cambridge. This is the logo for Guerrilla BV. It's a group. So they basically became the Cambridge studio of this group, which was originally named Lost Boys Games which was founded in 2000 as the result of a merging between three smaller studios. It employs like 150 developers from 20 different nationalities and is located in a 17th century canal mansion in Amsterdam. Although I tried to procure pictures of that because it sounded dank and I didn't find anything impressive. It seems they're relocating to something actually impressive, like in a little small island or some shit. Yeah. It's okay, Maker. I'm, uh, I'm glad if anything, if anybody in chat um, has anything to contribute to 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 the research, because this is this is this is this is effort effort stuff. Uh, so if I, if I miss something, because to get along with the script and reading chat, I miss stuff. Just feel free to tag me or uh, post later in the Discord. But I try to scroll up. I'm scrolling up now as I speak to stall. Sora on the Ocarina BBC was a pretty evil and pretty great puzzle game. Nice. So you played it. Cool. I, I like how we can always find people here that played shit. Apple Seed Covers. Bad Company Cover. Huh. Apple Seed Cover. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, oh, this one. Oh, look at this one. Let's uh, bring up what S Hunter said, because his name is S Hunter. This one. Be more similar. And the Bad Company video game cover is this. Yeah, I can see why it reminds you of it. <laughs> I mean, it's nothing peculiar, but... It's not any peculiar composition by any stretch, but I, I totally get it, of course. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that memory of yours. Thank you. Okay, so you now, we now know all of the history behind at least the development company. We didn't go in depth with the single developers. I might do that when other James Bond games get selected, but we did the full loop. The full circle. Uh, Goldie, is it okay to post a ashy penis in here? Yes, but only if you like it. Late 90s started the shitty render trend of game covers. So been, yeah, I don't like digital cover or slight shit. I mean, uh, yeah, that's not up to my tastes. It isn't. That one? I got right, the, I got the, I got the right one from a quick Google. Man, I'm good at Googling. I don't actually know shit, I just Google. 
That's why I'm, I'm, I'm a software developer, but anybody that does the same can relate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the last bit of info I have for you guys about this group is that they were also acquired by Sony in 2005 after the PlayStation 2 success that was Killzone. They are also responsible for the more modern huge hits that go by the name of Until Dawn and Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh, I always thought it looked pretty cool, to be honest. The game came out like two years ago or something. Super Karate Monkey Death Car, what's up? It's like a badass, good to see you. Oh, that's cool. An Amiga would be, it would make sense. Yeah, that's the original. That's a cool memory. Oh, you used to play it at school? Oh shit, that's, that's even cooler, yeah. That is even cooler. Nothing like that in Italian schools. I don't think so. It was an rich, it's, it's, it is an Amiga series that all the four James Pond games are Amiga games. They got ports to other systems, but they're all Amiga games. They're all original Amiga titles. I hope you found this uh, as charming as I did researching it, finding how often researching video game developing companies all goes around and ties back. Especially if you look at how many people from that era are still like active, maybe? Or rather the roots can be traced and what, no, I don't know. Uh, I find that very fascinating. We're now going to be talking about some unreleased titles. This is the unreleased shock part of the lower shock. Right? Anybody knows this game? Anybody a fan of this? <laughs> I've never played it, but I'm a fan of it. This is a pretty pretty known game. This is a pretty known game. This is um, Brutal Football, aka Beast Ball. Now, whilst carrying through Australian magazines, of all things, I found that Millennium had quite a handful of unreleased titles. Now, of course, this you see here is released for the Amiga, though. But I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to show you guys one of the videos I prepared for today. We say Sega, but we're talking about baseball. So, long story short is an almost finished version of the 1993 Amiga video game is what I got here for you guys on the Mega Drive. It was not released, but a prototype was sent out to the press. Of course, I just got a video from YouTube, of course. But the Super Nintendo version was also in the works. Now the audio, the audio is all sorts of fucked up, so brace for impact, but the rest of the game seems pretty playable. <laughs> Warned you. They tried with the music. So this is a this is a Mega Drive, but it's unreleased. It's never made it. Port of the Amiga game. You see the blood? That's all I wanted to show. There's this blood. I bet they weren't gonna put the blood on the Super Nintendo version. But the frame rate isn't bad, is it? I mean you're you're not you're not ironic, are you? I don't think you are. Uh, granted, there's no perspective tricks and it's just um, mostly vertical and the camera panning is always at the same speed, so... Well, okay, the ball's frame rate is kind of shit, but I suppose the scrolling is pretty pretty good. And the, the running animation cycle is... you can kind of appreciate it. Cash register timer. Ah, let's. We've seen what we wanted to see. A victory. Let's see the moment of victory. Yeah.
All right, game's dead. <laughs> the ball's still shining. Oh, look at that. Congratulations, Punishers. You're one day unfriendly. All right. Okay, anything else we don't want to miss? Nah, we're good. That was baseball. It did not make it to the Mega Drive. Yeah, it, it's pretty. It's pretty slow. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of Mutant League Football, even though that has actual perspective and stuff. It runs at like a one fourth of the speed of this, at least frame rate wise. But then again, if I, if I don't get too annoyed by the frame rate, or well, what matters is the game actually being fast paced. This one it looks pretty slow. At least this version, right? Now, that was baseball, alright? So, I found other stuff. I found other stuff. I found... <laughs> I, I, I found a Mr. Magoo video game, guys. Here's, here's, the, here's the magazine print. One of them, at least. Now, Mr. Magoo, of course, from the homonymous 1949 cartoon. Very little is known about this game. I managed to find a magazine scan and a Greek magazine scan, which we'll look at later. Now, this Australian scan is from the magazine uh, Magazone, issue 36, February 1994, which I would be very delighted to, to show you. If I saved it, did I save it? I might have not saved it. I never always say the other one. This was pretty quality. I have to show you the, the magazine scan, the, the cover. Oh, I have it. There it is. That's, that's the issue where I found this. <laughs> Everybody look at the armpit quickly. Quickly look at the armpit before it's due. Very, very accurate anatomy, but I like it. Magazine. Be a games slayer with Australia's hottest hints and tips. The Master System games you must have in 1994. <laughs> uh, boom shakalaka. Yeah, this, this wasn't the Sega Magazine initially. It became a 100% Sega Magazine later on, on its run. <laughs> so the Mr. Magoo game, right? Let's read this, what it says. This partially blind old stick has finally stumbled onto the Mega Drive for the first in a series of Magoo games. Really. It may not be an appealing concept, but you assume responsibility for the old man himself, encountering and avoiding more disasters than the average person would see in a lifetime. Control the action by setting up scenarios, preventing Magoo from coming to grief, within reason of course. The game will feature an endless list of dangerous situations, and swift integration with objects is the key to success. If you do well, the program will run like a series of humorous mini cartoon encounters. Huh. Okay, so it's like uh, you don't control your character, you, you control or adjust or maybe assemble previously the environment around Mr. Magoo. It's kind of like single pre lemmings, but big, bigger sprite. And it's saying like if you did a perfect run, it will be just an uninterrupted thing where it just looks like a cartoon. Format Mega Drive, Supplier Millennium, with one hand for some reason. Oh, look, Magoo was about to fall 20 stories to his death, but you saved him. What a pity that you saved him. It's pretty mean. So this is Mr. Magoo, but it is not all that I have, because I have this. Wait, wait, I have the, the, surely I got the, surely I also got the, the Greek scan. Here's the Greek scan. Some reason it didn't make it. Okay, the Greek scan is not functioning. Okay, I'll capture the window. Hold on. Thank you for the host. I'll get to it. Add window capture. Here it is. So I found this scan as well. I think it was an Italian website of somebody posting this. But they knew no Greek. Uh, it's all in Greek. But you can see some more screenshots. Right. You can make out more of what the game would have been. 
which were not, were, was not released. Well, because of magic, because I have magic, I actually translated this with my phone and Google Translate. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that. Hey, make it thanks to the host. All right, let's do this. Mr. Mago recounts the character that causes the most damage and destruction without wanting to for about forty years. Always armed with his long coat, his cane, and his mangora from the time he went on Sarun before. Brought a lot of laughter to young and old since 94. Nevertheless, he is quite polite and especially with the way he walks, he blames me because of his small mimicry. But our women, he flirts without hesitation despite his generally great age. It's paying respects. His is capital letter. Pay respects to Mr. Magoo. This is also the most significant problem which puts him in a quandary. The ones that bring laughter as well as their ending. Try to do this. Laugh. But their ending also brings laughter. This is what Millennium will try to do using static graphics plus background. Wanted to follow the feeling of the canons in the spotlight. This hero was competing. He will of course have the role of Mr. Magoo in his attention to cope with the difficulties that Bonanas put on him. Buildings that are demolished, etc. You will see scenes like the unfortunate one. Our hero is looking for a bonnet butterfly, which he throws down and catches it one by one. No, in turn, uh, throws out of the Parvothupo two buckets of water. And Mr. Magoo accepts the bucket on his head. He has to lie down so that a horn can bounce and put out the fire in the living room of the building. We definitely need to look at it closely. All right, so memes aside, what does this, <laughs> what does this tell you? Just some uh, scenes that the reviewer tried in his prototype card or something like... Um, Butterfly thing, the building catching fire, some anecdotes about the character, nothing. Nothing revealing, of course, but then again, it's not kind of the video game that would have been like fucking crazy or whatnot. It's, it's fucking Mr. Magoo. <laughs> that is a capture of my phone, yes. Yes, you now have access to my to my phone. It looks like Lemmings. Maybe you can also interact in real time like Lemmings. No idea. No idea. At any rate, that is not all. There's just more. There's uh, <laughs> there's three more unreleased games by Millennium. I have to show you. Here's Motormania. It's absolutely not what it would sound like by the title. <laughs> It's one of the many crit-friendly video games by Millennium that did not make it, but was previewed in the same magazine issue that I showed you earlier. Australian February 94 magazine, issue 36. I have a bunch of scans here. We should, we should zoom in and see what it's actually saying. It's very colorful at least. So this is this is this is supposedly um, it's a magazine. So this is a mega dry scans, right? You don't get micros here. There's more like Nick isn't it? about as much street cred. Small cars work is never done. Next, it's making a set of garden furniture. Okay. Check the other side of the screen. Motormania, fun, cutesy, and chock -a full of cars. This is another game aimed principally at younger Mega Drive bashers. You control Mickey the Micra, who's Micra, whose job it is to end the chaos that is polluting the car factory. Kind of hard to read on pink. For some strange reason, only Mickey can accomplish this task and restore order to the production line. To do so, he must be guided, driven back through various production stages, including a paint workshop, wind tunnel, tire shop, etc. Tire with an Y? Is that a joke? As you can see, the graphics are stylized and wacky. Mickey is not bad for a simulated chunk of metal. Like a real car, he has to be uh, driven carefully, as he may run out of fuel at any time. Oh, so the, it had a fuel system. Okay, that would have been interesting. I like, I like fuel system. I don't like timers, but fuel is like your gameplay timer. I like it. I like that a lot. Former Mega Drive, Supply of Millennium. I have more. But I guess we get the idea what it would have been. Uh, disclaimer that both Motor Mania, or as you can see here, Micromania, as it was also going to be called, 
were in the works together for both the Amiga and the Mega Drive. At least for the Amiga and the Mega Drive both. Around at the same time around as the next game I'm gonna show you, we actually got an Amiga release. But I got pictures for the Mega Drive unreleased one. These two, Micromania or Motormania and Mr. Magoo, were not so lucky. Tire is the UK spelling for Tire? Really? I had no idea. Thank you for telling me. Hey, Saxon, good to see you. Saxon, I saw you streaming a um, fucking game. I forgot what the name is. Saxon was streaming a cool game last night. You should follow Saxon. Okay, so I got this shot. Uh, this is the shot. Look at this. This is pretty pristine. It will have been a, a screenshot of the Amiga. You can see. Uh, yeah. Uh, see if I can make out some of the French. You're supposed to control the Miki Micra, a model of uh, the Nissan, without touching obstacles and without consuming the fuel. Yeah. Easier said than done. I've never studied French in my life, but it's from Latin, so I'm from ancient Rome, so I can make it a, a bit. Oxfordal is exactly that game had really good orcs and trolls values. I like that a lot. I just hope to catch you again. Um, okay, Micromania, there you go. Very high quality screenshot. Uh, this 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 is this got text, but it's it's it's. It's German. I don't. I, I can't make out German like I can French. But let's. What it says here. Fabric chaos. Animus. Still as still eyes graphics. There's a word that takes up an entire line. Yes, Queen Gates Peel. Benzin. So that's fuel. Benzin is fuel. So they all mentioned the fuel mechanics. So that was like the main gameplay gimmick, which I can totally get behind. Doesn't it? What's everybody's take on like fuel? Fuel in video games. Everybody ever plays Subterranea. Subterranea is a great game. Everybody should play. About f talking about fuel games. So they got this screenshot. Nissan, look at that. It was actually a Nissan sponsored video game. It was that they, they got like a hmm, maybe that has to do with why they got uh, canned. And Mr. Magoo as well would have had to get some licenses. Although I suppose in the early 90s, licenses were not that um, expensive, right? <laughs> no, I can't read that at all. I don't stand, I don't stand a chance. Look at the other screenshots. Unreleased Mega Drive games. Oh shit. Why does OBS do this? It's like hellish. Now if I move this, I'm gonna move something else as well. Okay. It locks down like two sources. I wanna see this one. This one looks interesting. What's going on here? Oh, the background stuff, okay. Oh well, there's a button, maybe this is probably just gonna be some puzzle elements, but this game never came out. Not on the Amiga, not on the Mega Dream. Magoo is my real father and he worked as an engineer for Nissan. Thank you for the high quality chat line, Super Karate Monkey Death Car, and your nickname just adds to it. Thank you. Uh, to me, counts. Uh, Counts very good. Counts very, very ranks very high. That's what I'm trying to say. Moving on, moving on on the unreleased Millennium video games, we got Pinky. We got Pinky, but this time we moved on to the 40th Megazone issue, June 1994. It's pretty pretty high quality as well. Free poster inside. Poster. Cheat and Prosper will show you how. Australia's 100% Sega magazine. Magazine. Win a pro action replay, guys. Dracula Unleashed. Something to get your teeth into. Asterix 3, Tomcat Halley, doubles with Streets of Rage 3. 
Double switch, what's that? Plus the best joke in Australia? Oh man? What what is it? <laughs> Fuck. What is it? Uh I'll, I'll give you a link. Maybe if somebody wants to check that out. Here's, here's a link to the magazine, guys. If anybody's interested, joke aside. Those, those are uploaded to Cigaretro. If you Google Cigaretro magazine, you'll find all the available scans. <laughs> all right. All right, so Pinky. Let's take a look here. Now, this was actually meant to be a port of the Amiga video game Pinky, right here, which actually came out. Millennium published it in 1994 and Data designed, developed it, apparently at the very least. It's a preview of magazine now. This was supposed to come out for the Mega Drive, and it didn't. A cute pink alien that hails from the far edge of the galaxy. Pinky is not your average superhero. He, huh, he and his race suffer from vertigo, are allergic to pain, and abhor violence. So if your favorite game is Mortal Kombat, then this may not be the sausage for you. <laughs> Naturally, Pinky is weapon-free, but he does have the use of Pinky Mobile, which offers some protection. The basic model is a single-wheeled pod, but this can be upgraded during the course of the game. Crafted in the mold of the James Pond games, this is a humorous offering about a cute kind of mission. You see, Pinky is on a quest to retrieve the last few dinosaur eggs in existence, preventing the extinction of the species. What a guy! Is it dinosaurs or dinosaurs? Let's look at stuff. It's the kind of face that only a mother could love, but it's pink. That's the mouth? Wow. Pinky happily zooms around in the Pinky Mobile. Hey, isn't he on Easter Island? So I think if you get hit in this game, you'll die. But if you're in the Pinky Mobile, you stand a chance. Kind of like Sonic with the rings. If you want to make that kind of um, parallelism. The terrain is green and gooey, and you can't bet it ain't good for a hero. Luckily, he's upgraded his craft. They actually have upgrades. That'd be cool. It's like you bought them. But this, this is a video game that exists on the Amiga. It tried to exist on the Mega Drive, but it went badly. A brave new kind of hero, it says on the bottom. Barely readable. Good test color choice. Now, last, maybe the, the coolest one. <laughs> Pinky is nude. You can see the, the other snork. Um, World of Trolls. World of Trolls, not to be confused with the Amiga Trolls video game, which has pretty good music. I was posting on that last night on my Discord, listening to the music of Trolls and the Amiga. It's pretty good. Very colorful little video game. Seems really good. Really good music. And this one seems to be an original video game, which was previewed in at least this magazine, the Australian Magazine again. Which is the 40th issue. Let's take a look. This is all I got about World of Trolls. The stuff is not even on uh, freaking uh, Unseen 64. I tried to look for it there. Could not find it. If you own one of those horrible little troll dolls and you have your keys attached to a hunk of plastic with green hair, this may be the, the ideal game for you. It's one of the kiddies with fairly simple gameplay by the looks of it. Select from a large array of trolls, all with special powers, and guide the troll of your choice around its densely populated and foggy world. The idea is to bring color, literally, back into this gloomy and uninspiring land. Collect jewels as you progress, as jewels are bright and pretty, so help make the world nicer, right? Not surprisingly, baddies try to eradicate your troll-like existence. Kill them by covering them with custard, then eating them. <laughs> First, I need to know what is custard. Then I'm gonna ask you guys if that is a thing in the, in the show, the franchise of trolls. I had trolls as a kid. I had I had one of those little plastic shits, homemade custard. Variety of culinary preparation based milk or cream cooked with egg yolk to thicken it. Sometimes also flour cornstarch. Very inconsistent with sauce, basically. 
Oh, it's at this. Oh, okay. I get it. I get it. Your final goal is to return the world to a rich and beautiful place. Hey, you liked it better before. I got original Trolls AGA game box. Till is great. Yeah, isn't it? It's really cool. It's really cool. <laughs> Death Gar. Um. See the other side. It's got spiky green hair and attitude. Could Johnny Rotten be making a comeback? I always thought trolls hit under bridges and ate goats. These are 90s trolls. There are heaps of trolls to choose from, each with unique powers. Hmm, which to choose? Perhaps the green haired one is the only one you're showing me in the screenshot. In the same sprite position over and over again. <laughs> That's all I got in this game. I have no other info or screenshots in this. At all. At all. Now we're going to conclude the cycle of millennium video games that never happened by talking about an extremely relevant thing, which is something that happened in 2013. 13. 2013, a Kickstarter crowdfunding, which I'll send you the link in chat now, but I have all the stuff to show about it. A crowdfunding in 2013 for a James Pond reboot was launched. It was first advertised, though, by its original designer, Chris Sorrell, who then got involved in the project. Let's have a look at it. Spoilers. I already said that. It did not meet its goal. Not even close. Like 10% and then they stopped because they knew that it wasn't going to happen. Hi, I'm Chris Sorrell. Okay, we got some content here. Hi, I'm Chris Sorrell. Back when I was 18, I worked on the James Bond games. I was responsible for the design, programming and graphics on James Bond 1, 2 and 3. Since that time, my life has been totally fish-free. I mean, I don't even eat the things that I can help it. But even now, 20 years later, people still ask me about James Pond. Having seen Robocop ported to every platform under the sun, even including a few high-end kitchen appliances or so I hear, it seems like Pond really needs to get with the times. I've never owned the rights to the brand, so it wasn't until they asked me to be part of this campaign that I had the chance to think about this. It struck me that if we could make an all-new Pond game that takes the best qualities of the old games but brings everything right up to date, and that could be something pretty cool. Whether we can do this depends on you guys. Personally, I have no idea if there are enough people that still care about James Pond after all these years. If you do, and if you can help us to fund this thing, then for my part, I'd be very happy to do anything I can to help create a brand new game that captures everything that we used to love about Pond. But maybe this time we skip the chocolate biscuits. <laughs> I think the possibilities are pretty exciting. I hope you agree. Everything that we used to love about Pond. But maybe this time we skip the chocolate biscuits. I think the possibilities are pretty exciting. I hope you agree. Very low quality video for a, um, an anything announcement or pitch. Like maybe that was the problem with that. You know, no fish. This guy suffered PTSD from just but that's what he said. I couldn't make it out. Like what? Without fuzz? Without fish? I I see. So, there's that video, but there's this other video, guys, which is a bit longer, but it's also uh, related to this Kickstarter that failed. Let's jump right into it. In 2003, Gameway Europe acquired the rights to the James Bond franchise, and since then they have done... not a lot, really. Until now. I've never seen this. James Pond? Uh, hi, my name's Chris Sorrell. Uh, I'm the original developer of James Pond. What's Pond doing now? I mean, to endure terrible kind of fishy tortures, willed slightly and waiting for his moment to escape and uh, come back. James Pond? Well, I was development director. This is Sean Connery. Millennium Interactive. Where do I think he is now? I guess the missions he's been working on have just been too... Dude! Maybe we'll find out what he's 
It's got the Japanese release of Pawn there on his desk. Look at that shit. It's so proud of it. <laughs> That's the artwork to the third game, I think. Prussian Starfish? Or the second game? He's got... Look at this guy's... Look at this guy's um, a freaking um, on the left. Look at look at this guy's uh, Powerpuff Girl. That's what you call it in English, right? Yeah, it's pretty cool. This guy knows how to arrange his room for a video recording. Hell yeah. Only James Bond's shit in there. And Powerpuff Girls. And the Star Wars robot. you have been up to in due course. James Bond? My name's Michael Hayward and I used to be the Managing Director of Millennium Interactive. I wonder what Pond's doing now. I have no idea. After all, he is a secret agent. He's probably waiting for his next mission. I think he's been, I th I think he's been honing his talents as an agent. <laughs> oh, hi. Welcome to our Kickstarter campaign. My name is Jeremy Cook, and I have been in the computer games industry for over 30 years. Um, I used to have a driving game studio called Tech, and this game, we developed this game's got a like meme on Power his... F1 for IDOS, Johnny Herbert Grand Prix, <laughs> Road Rash this... on the Game Boy Advance, Castro Honda. He's got a meme in front of his phone printed out. What? Yeah, come on, Castro Honda Superbikes sold over half a million units in North America. Wait, what? We're missing... 22 years ago, 22 years in North America. Road Rash on the Game Boy Advance. Castro Honda Superbike World Champions. I don't think I was going to have heard of Castro Honda. What? Whatever it was. Yeah, come on, Castro Honda Superbikes sold over half a million units in North America. The fuck is. <laughs> 22 years I ago. I can't make James out. Pond hit it gets too British for me. And has never really left our thoughts. And for good reason, too. You see, oh. James Pond did some pretty revolutionary stuff in its day, from non-linear gameplay and playable sidekicks to product placement and vehicles in a platformer. What we want to do is to bring back Pond, collect everything together that made Pond what it is, and produce a game that not only embodies everything great about the previous games, but also acknowledges the not so great stuff and delivers it with updated graphics, sound and interfaces on modern day touch, desktop and console hmm. devices. A fact in the US. Think of it as a James Pond greatest hits. Yes, there will be nods to all of the old retro gaming series, but what we want to do is to create a modern James Pond for modern devices. What do you think is this We've comic? We've already done the hard work of acquiring the James Pond license, and we're bringing the license back to the independents so that we can make sure that with an unobtrusive publishing partner, we deliver the game that the fan base want to see. But we need your help to make that happen. Back when I was 18, I worked on the James Bond games. I was responsible for the design, programming and graphics on James Bond 1, 2 and 3. Since that time, my life has been totally fish free. I mean, I don't even eat the things that I can help it. But even now, 20 years later, people still ask me about James Bond. Yeah, this is the part we've seen. Having seen Robocop ported to every <clears> platform <throat> under the sun, even in high-end kitchen appliances. Pick a British so game that have kickstarted <laughs> <laughs> I've never owned the rights to the brand. It reminds me of the fucking part of this campaign, ocean artist. Think about this. This is also balls. I remember the name. If we could make an all new Pond game that takes the best qualities of the old games but brings everything right up to date, <laughs> me too, that could be something pretty cool. Me too. Whether we can do this, <laughs> probably the placement is late job. I have no idea <laughs> if there are enough people that still care about James Pond after all these years. <laughs> if you do, and if you can help us to fund this thing. Then for my part, I'd be very happy to do anything I can to help create a brand new game that captures everything that we used to love about Pond. But maybe this time we skip the chocolate biscuits. I think the possibilities are pretty exciting. I hope you agree. It wouldn't hurt to smile Let's after landing that sick joke. Let's together make that Pond instalment that you've been waiting 20 years to see. So back Pond. Boom! Let's see. Change of scenery, motherfuckers. Is my great aunt's freaking... Curtains, dude. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? Though? Our favorite FI5H agent, 
back on our gaming screens. Well, what was the... Why? So back installment. Oh, it... You've been waiting 20 years to see. It's the same room. So back pawn. And let's see it's standing our on the favorite desk. FI5H agent back on our gaming screens. He's just standing up and... <laughs> McDonald ads. So it was 18. Oh yeah, me too, Sly Guy. Of course. Of course. Hmm. That was it for the video. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's a sad story, but why don't we look at it? I, I want to look at it. Do you guys want to look at it? I want to look at it. I want to look at the um, the Kickstarter. I'm going to show you something particular. <laughs> Hold on, I remembered about something else particular about it. <laughs> All right, so here's the Kickstarter, right? Yeah. Um, oh, fuck. Hold on, because I got like a 21 by 9 monitor. I got this on, so let me... Make that uh, more reasonably si sized. That's more reasonable. All right, so funding cancelled. Funding cancelled. Um, almost 18,000 euros pledged out of 112,000. 294 gold. 336 backers. Funding for this project was cancelled by the project creator on October the 8th, 2013. Can I make this even tighter so that we can... Uh... Yeah, look at that. Look at this. Streaming. I'm streaming on the internet. I'm good at it. I'm good at it. What Jiggy said is, is important, I, I believe. 2013 was still pretty early days for Kickstarter. There wasn't as clear of a blueprint, a blueprint for what a successful Kickstarter campaign looked like at that point. I have to agree. I have to agree. Now, cod alert, cod alert. The top of the water engine, James Ponder, is appointed to an inkjet message market, red herring, and is now occupied on a top secretion, secretion mission. Thin out the latest news at the squid links here. Just click that. Just, just click that. Facebook page. I don't have a Facebook account anymore. Wait, there is stuff. Wait, some stuff was posted in uh, 2015. Join my clam. You know where I am? Four likes. Some article reposting. Speedrun Robocard. Valentine's Day. Yeah. That's odd, though. Uh, after the campaign failed, there was an attempt at reviving in a social a bit. Like, look at that. February 2015. Anyway, this is the stuff that uh, was mentioned in the video, pretty much. The, the, the deal, though, is... Um, Rewards aside, the deal here is nothing was shown. Like, this is the only thing that is here about the game, right? It's like, we're starting from scratch, we need your help, but we're not actually bringing anything. Like, we've got our ideas very clear, but we haven't done anything, right? That is the issue. Ambition, whatever, but you're asking for a hundred thousand pounds. It's, it's not gonna work. No modern nonsense, so they're making it clear they're not gonna put any DLC on that, shit like that. I mentioned about the biscuits, guys. We all know that Penguin, one of the chocolatiest biscuits in the world, apparently featured in the original game. Which, although at the time was some big corporate product placement, the designers' slightly reverent attitude and their sheer awesomeness have made them part of the game's charm. So we want them back. We're currently trying to get into talks with McVitie's. To see the return, but if you have another product that you like placed, I wouldn't mind the pond treatment and get in contact. After all, we are looking for funding. Makes sense. What we already done, acquired the full historic rights of James Bond, got Chris Sorrell, got 
the talk to the other team members, generate some initial funding. We set the goals and we made a campaign. We, we literally did nothing. To, to, that didn't do anything. The video game was not even one pixel. It's just, yeah, just the idea. To, uh, but they did sell it to more than 300 people though and raised uh, 18,000 uh, pounds, euros, 18,000 euros. Hey, Dr. Mindbender, welcome. But it's, it's you know, uh, this is spoilers for the sound shock, but uh, Richard Joseph uh, died in, uh, it was 2007, at lung ca cancer, uh, sadly. We're working closely with PJ Belcher Pro Audio to make sure the audio in game is top notch. Yeah, meet the team. There's a lot. There's a lot to say here, but there's not a uh, some good lore with the devs here. But the issue, the issue is obviously the there's no, there's nothing. There's nothing to show. If you want to make a fucking Kickstarter, you have to. I mean, this is pretty lore for an empty and soulless sports game. You take that back. I suppose it's just, I have fond memories of this game. It's a pico. Um, this is something I want to show you, the stretch goals, right? Here they call them the flex goals. I don't know, maybe that's yeah, stretch goals. Now we're doing them a little differently, uh, flex goals. Okay. Now, I hope everybody is, is sitting down here because they had a stretch goal for the Wii U. Had a stretch goal for 3DS. Are you seeing this? And I had a stretch goal for iOS and Android, but also for the Oya. Oh yeah. <laughs> Linux, PS4, PS3, PS Vita, Xbox. But this, this, this is something that isn't this internet page. All right. Get Chris Sorrell on board for 30k. Wasn't he already on board and 30k were not raised? That's wag. Uh, this last thing I want to show about this campaign is the, the final comment. Project is cancelled. Coming to an early end. October the 7th, 2013. Hello everyone, today after much discussion and thought we made a difficult decision to end our campaign early. Although we have 12 days to go, it's clear that we aren't going to make our £100,000 goal. So instead of pretending otherwise and continuing the updates, we decide to be honest with ourselves and with you and stop. Amico soon. You take that back. I know you're just trying to troll me. People might believe you and not get interested in what's going to be an awesome system. And the only interest is system I'm in being interested in. It's, uh, I don't fucking know. The 3DS I never got because I just wanted to play Order of Ecclesia on it. Never did. <laughs> Fuck. Um, the campaign wasn't the success we'd hoped for. This was for a few reasons, all of which we plan on addressing and then making a comeback with a new, stronger campaign. For now, a few honest truths, we came to this with a little game to show. No game at all. Pretty sure we were asking for a lot of faith from you guys, and our mantra from the start has always been to keep the game design as open as possible. With the fans calling the shots. It was a risk and it didn't work out, but I will say a huge thank you to everyone who pledged. There's actually only two of us, big reveal. There's Jeremy, Mr. Gamer, and owner of James Pond. It's myself, PJ, bro, and as a project manager, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. All right. You all deserve to see more evidence of what we might do to make the game. Recognize that we had, what we had wasn't enough. And this is pretty long. No. Okay. Pond will be back, guys. It's been seven years. Pond's still not back. Even though Pond came out on the Switch. But Pond might be back someday, guys. It's, it, it can happen. Let's hope it happens. 
All right. We concluded the developing shock section. Let's uh, let's move to sound. Let's move over to the sound business. Catch up with you right here. Yeah, this machine hugs pretty much. <laughs> Porting stretch goals. Yeah. Ah, oh, what is Zanky? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Hold on. We got. I got something here. Thank you, Zanky, for the. Um, for the quality. The quality game starring James Code, James Goldie and the Aquabats. <laughs> I look good, dude. I look pretty good there. I gotta say, it 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 suits me. I look pretty, pretty hot in that. Pretty hot. Hey, Pioxed, it's going. <laughs> Imagine product placement being one of the key points of pride you have in your game. <laughs> hey, Jay. Yeah, that's pretty odd. That's pretty odd. Yeah, the, the final apology, whatever, make this, the campaign sound a bit dodgier than it really was. I gotta agree. I gotta agree. Hey, SM, what's going on? Uh, is there something in the background I missed? Fish in the background. Fish. Oh, yeah, it says fish in the background, yeah. That's, that's, that's how it is in the... Um... North American release. Who's that? SM, thanks to the host. One of this gonna eat fish tomorrow. <laughs> Me too. I should have something. Um Sound Shock. Sound shock. So we kinda spoiled it. But the composer for the pawn series is passed away uh, uh 13 years ago or something. This is Richard Joseph. Richard Joseph, everybody. That's his face. On it's probably Commodore 64 the machine tape or something on. Richard Joseph scored all the four James Pond video games. Although the Mega Drive version utilizes the Electronic Arts Steve Hayes sound engine, which is the most primitive one, so we shall not expect a great sounding score for from the Mega Drive version. There are no additional credits for the Mega Drive sound, it just credits Joseph as the original author. But in an interview for Remix 64, however, he mentions being interested in listening to Rob Hubbard, Rob Hubbard's Mega Drive conversion of his Robocard tunes. So we can assume that's how this other soundtrack conversion also happened. Rob Hubbard. He also mentions. He also mentions, perhaps more interestingly, how the Mega Drive was his least preferred format to work with out of the 12 different formats he worked with, the Amiga being the favorite. Born in the UK. On the 23rd of April 1953, Richard Joseph was not only a prominent composer in the computer video game music scene with Commodore 64 and Amiga, but also a former musician, having collaborated with the likes of Hugh Patgam and Trevor Horn, releasing a single and joining a group are also things to note on that regard. He most notably scored soundtracks for titles such as Defender of the Crown. Let's bring some games here. Is some games. Anybody doesn't know Defender of the Crown? Defender of the Crown, uh, Barbarian. I believe Barbarian 2 as well. Look at that beast cover art. So good. Holy shit. I didn't have any print of that. Just, just the land. Fuck the dragon dinosaur thing. Looks like a toy and a Barbarian. Just the land. Uh, also, Sacred Armor of Antiriod, also known as uh, Red Warrior. Red, not red. Also, scores soundtracks for Bitmap Brothers and sensible software video games, such as, respectively, The Chaos Engine, 
also known as Soldier of Fortune if, you, if you're a Genesis player, I suppose. Where the use of dynamic music was innovative and appreciated and megalomania, which I love a bunch, where voice actors were used. Voice actors were used in this game. I played both of these as a kid on the Mega Drive. Uh, Chaos Engine and Megalomania. I, I got Megalomania back. I don't have Chaos Engine anymore. First Samurai demo disc included. Yeah, this, this game rules. This game is the fucking best. There's so much going on in this game. He would also use vocals in a title screens, but perhaps most sensational is how he would bring in, or try to bring in, artists such as Brian May for... A Rise of the Robots. Now I'm not I'm not making this up. This is Rise of the Robots. It came in apparently 13 discs. And it was hyped at the best fucking video game of all times for like a full year and shit. Big big paper board, uh giant robots in every store and whatnot. It was the most epic shit. And then it came out and it was it was pretty bad. Brian May's 5 second looping Rise of the Robots 2 <laughs> Mentioned like 8 times in the box of the manual, there you go <laughs> Have you plucked my latest work? Please I need exposure to play builds Um, I, Sure, I, I did, not, not on stream yet Well, let's do it Zenki, Zenki translated um, Bahamut Zenki for the Mega Drive there you go. That, that's a plug. Did they do it right? Ask me again later, I'll, I'll repeat it. But yeah, now Bahamut Senki on the Mega Drive now has a translation, guys. It's a good translation, too. I vouch for it. You can play that in English. It's a cool game. So that's Rise of the Robots. Um, other stuff it did on that regard, bringing artists to perform on video games. Um, there, was the, there was John Fox on Gods. That was John Fox and Speedball 2. I think. That was Betty Boo and Magic Pockets. This game recently got, I think, uh, recently. But this game got a, 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 it got a Mega Drive version as well. Which either got um, resuscitated later and then made it playable and whatever. Or just was done as a port from scratch but there's a mega drive unofficial version for this totally unlicensed and unreleased but it's playable it was re-released recently is what i'm trying to say also captain sensible on sensible soccer this is a uh, sensible soccer 1.1 but whatever music by captain sensible look at that i got that right i didn't even realize it says music by captain sensible i I now know that I am a good streamer, guys. I now know that. Oh yeah, Z. Z was cool. I played it on PlayStation 1. Z is cool. Z is really cool. Yeah, all those games rule, dude. Yeah, I like, I like that I'm reading good chat lines about all of them. Is that cool? It? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. My favorite of that bunch is... Ah, oh, just... I don't know, man. It has to be Megalomania. But I grew up with the Mega Drive versions of uh, Megalomania, Speedball 2, Brutal Deluxe, and uh, the Chaos Engine. And while we're on the topic, also Xenon 2, Mega Blast. <laughs> am I a sensible streamer there? I don't know, what do you think? Am I, am I sensible? I think, I think I'm pretty sensible. What do you guys think, guys? Am I, am I a sensible streamer? Do I, do I deserve your time? I think I do. Now, another game uh, Richard Joseph scored in the old days of video games that matter to us, the old ones are... It's Cauldron 2, The Pumpkin Strikes Back in 1986. Although it was a remote job for the States and enjoyed doing it, it only had two weeks to churn out one tune and 20 sound effects, so it kind of regrets not being able to do better with that. But... The credits cite him under scintillating sound. I'm, 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 I'm kind of weird that I couldn't find um, couldn't find a box art for Cauldron 2. 
It's the cauldron, super cauldron, and there's a compilation thingy. Yeah. Hey, it's passing, good to see you. I cauldron. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I, it's, every time I do this kind of deep dive research, take hours, uh, I always can't come back with like a bigger list of games to play. This one, this one, this is one of them. But the previous one were more I, the previous ones also were pretty, pretty hyper. Oh, go ahead, Spasm. Looking forward to that. Always open. Okay, it's likely going back to Richard Joseph here. Put this up. The Cauldron one, no cheats playthrough. Why would I use cheats? Uh, Living Orchestra, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so in the later part of his career, so up to 2006, because he died in 2007, he assumed more the role of directing and sound assigning, leaving the orchestral composition to specialists. He was also involved with the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion under the note of dialogue post-production team. He died of lung cancer on the 4th of March 2007 at the age of 53. He best preferred being remembered for this earlier stuff, such as the Commodore 64 output games and. Uh, the Amiga ones for, for sensible software and Bitmap Brothers, especially. That that was Richard Joseph. That was the lower shock for James Bond. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed preparing it. Hopefully you, you you like it. It was pretty good. Well, we're sitting at uh, we're sitting at uh, almost two hours of stream. That's pretty good. Like an hour and a half of James Bond lore is um, is is pretty pretty entertaining. No, uh, Biko didn't enjoy. It was awful. Not. I need to. I need to look at the manual, guys. We have to look at the manual first. Did you do the Xenon Two soundtrack? I don't know. Did you? Good question. My own pack exclusive penguin joke on this skirt. Right there. What do penguins wear to the beach? Fuck you, God. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> no, the joke is a big innie. It's pretty bad, but thank you for sharing that. Um... Dan Z, man. <laughs> do you know if the music for this game is all original or if any of it is licensed? Any, uh, yeah, there's some. Um, um, Classical music bullshit. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. It's not all original. It was Wit Taker. Okay, cool. Yeah, Wit Taker was the composer for more than a handful of games that we featured today. Hey, Raccoon, what's going on? Discord. There is a Discord. There's also a schedule now. There's a schedule. Yes. If you scroll down the stream description, you'll see the schedule. It's not streaming. Uh, Monday. Wednesday, Friday, this time, and then Sunday. Bigger, bigger penis on Sunday. So you should check that out. Schedule. Schedule. It's going to be brainwashing for me now, guys, because I got schedule. I have to push my schedule. Okay, so the only manual schedule. The only manual scan on cigarette Retro here seems to be for the US version, which is fine. I have a copy, but it's like the most ghetto copy I own. I usually collect them in um, good state with the manual. I don't remember why I got this, but it's no manual and it's shit state. So I asked for a refund, so I basically did not pay for this. It's a PAL cartridge. It's gonna go into a Japanese Mega Drive. That doesn't work out. I'll, I'll fire up the schedule, the, the, the Mega SD or the EverDrive. I even closed Fantasy Star Line 2 to watch fully. Somewhere in the loft I have a box of broken controllers from this game. Alright, I'm excited for that. I'm pretty good at button mashing, but I got no stamina, so... <laughs> uh, the manual, the Paul manual. So that's interesting, manual-wise, right? Because this is a European game, but... The European Mega Drive manuals are shit. I'm looking forward here to see. 
but the US one actually holds. Let's make this full screen, can we? Nah. Okay. Oh wow, there's there's more uh, lore here. Artist biography. Name Steve Back. Can you read this? There's a fish here. Occupation programmer. Lives in Derbyshire, England. Age 104. Background. Born sickle back in the Sargasso Sea, captured and adopted by a passing millionaire. Founder of the now famous Fish in Need Agency. His worthy activities include helping little old fishes across the river, attaching leather boots to fishermen's hooks, picketing parsley sauce factories, maintaining the rungs on salmon ladders, rooming seahorses. What is rungs? Walking the dogfish, other extreme acts of bravery, dream job loan shark, interests 5-30%. Favorite food, smoke keeper. Okay, that's the one of the artists. Pretty cool. Hey, good night, ass hunters. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. It's all fish related memes, because it has to be, right? It's James Bond. Rungs is the oh, okay, that's what a rung is. I still don't get the joke. Sean Nichols, graphic artist, uh, lies 9. Sorry, got a bit confused there. Age 27 and a fifth. Background fell from a passenger ship at age 2 months, saved from drowning by passing Halibut Shore. Adopted by mother fish, raised at one with fish kind. Graduated from a school of whales. Winner of three Direct Dolphin Swimming Awards. Captured by Scottish fishing trawler. At age 25, thrown back some day, captured again at 26, sold into slavery at Vector D. <laughs> where he sometimes produces scanned animations. So Vector D is the company we were um, dissecting earlier, one of them at least. Dream Job co-star on Flipper. <laughs> interest, interest, spawning. Favorite food, caviar. Warning to owners, blah, blah, blah. Danger takes a break. Perilous missions, wicked villains, and gorgeous mermaids make up the everyday life of an underwater agent. But even a top fish operative like James Bond needs a break from the undersea grottos of international intrigue. Pond is no wet fish when it comes to this leisure time. It's rather hack into some furious fun action than lie in the sun with a bunch of beached whales. That's why he and his pals started the Aquatic Games. Eight competitive events plus two bonus events really separate the men from the minnows. Two bonus events? How do I get to do those? I gotta get those. So start pumping those gills and aim for the finish line. As Pond himself says, it's a hell of a good time. <laughs> that one I liked, because it wasn't clear until I said it. Yeah. Programmer equals artist, as you heard it here. Hey Mia, what's up? Thanks to the host. Um, yeah, this, 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 um, I gotta say, all the kind of uh, electronic arts manual, like I've seen this in um, Haunting, staring Porter guy. Probably something about EA trying to get them to do sh good shit like this on the manuals, right? Some kind of quality control from the email. The Mega Drive electronic arts releases are so fucking good that the, 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 the quality of the manuals, dude, just go and stop watching your stream, go on Cigarette Road, check out the scan of a Starflight manual, the US Starflight manual, and read that there's a novel in it, <laughs> there's full screen, all paintings, it's, it's so good. That's a dinner. Thanks for the recipe, Mindbender. Thanks for the recipe. Good beams. <laughs> he could have been a James Bond programmer, Dr. Mindbender. <laughs> Alright. Let the games begin. Wipe away any seaweed, ocean debris, and dead marine animals from your Sega Genesis. This is the US manual. Make sure the power switch in the Sega Genesis is off. Carefully blow away any sand 
off your aquatics cartridge and insert it into the slot in the Genesis. Press firmly to lock the cartridge into place. The manual is telling you to blow into the cartridge just so they can make the fucking sand joke fly. You know, the power switch on. Remove any scuba gear that may impair your vision and press start. Well, what are you waiting for? Get out there, perform like Skelly Thompson and do fish bread. Now who is Skelly Thompson supposed to be? Okay. Double trouble two players. Oh, you can play this three and four. I should try this with friends. Okay. Oh, there's a hard mode. Piranha practice. James Pond's workout is practice in easy mode. Game Gear micro stream. Not interested. In the least. Hey, Comet Tales, welcome. Yeah, I'm not interested in that, I gotta say. I don't really care for the Game Gear. See me doing a handheld stream is typically Atari Lynx games. The hard that it's gonna be any other handheld. <laughs> Daily Thompson, okay, I imagine that's a swimmer or an Olympic um, athlete. In single player competitions, you're aiming to win medals uh, gold if you're a god, <laughs> silver if you're pretty good, and bronze if you're well not as good. We're going for gold. That's all I need to know. We are going for gold. Mark my words. We're going for gold. It's the only way to beat this game. If unless you don't read the manual, <laughs> you don't want to be a god. Jeez, how could you not be a god? Go to bowling gold, indeed. Oof. Daily Thompson's Declan with a messy. Oh, okay, cool. English decathlete. Mm. I'm a jicky playing. Um, what was that decathlete? Decathlon? What the fuck was that? The PS1 Saturn. Probably both. In each event, you can also earn bonus points. If you earn enough of those, you can participate in bonus events. Ooh, you gotta play for score a little bit. If you win a bonus event, you'll get a shield of merit. Going up to six shields, the highest tool for a single player competition consists of eight gold medals and six shields. Oh, yeah, that sounds scary. <laughs> that sounds really scary. If you don't qualify for any event, the competition is over. This is one of the games that can be beaten by getting all bronze medals and just one shield or some shit like that. But I'm gonna go for 100%. I, I'm, I'm gonna go for eight gold medals and six shields. This game is important. Multiplayer competition is your out for points. Grab as many as you can in order to shut down competition. Right, multiplayer games, there's a uh, there's Womp Bay Splashers, manned by Steve Clam. Team of Aquabats, that is. The Healy Island Hoppers, Mickey O'Shell. There's uh, Flappy's Flyers, trained by Flappy McBig. And then Billy the Squid is a trainer for the Deep Sea Dippers. Alright, so you, you gotta know how to play the events, right? So I might just keep this handy during the stream but there's supposed to be eight events or something fading times okay that's another mini game bonus events there you go credits product management neil the water peruma okay that's that's a that's a last name original music and sound effects richard joseph but it doesn't say that rob hobbit did um Porting. Is it just uh, lane porting? Isn't it? The name is Pond. James Pond. The original James Pond. British Secret Service. Name James Pond. Agent ID Double Bubble 7. Birthplace Wales, Great Britain. Weapon Bubble Gun with silencer. Mission Save the Oceans. Let's fuck the earth. Yeah. That is all. Now that is all. Now that's all the lore shark. All of it. Now did you enjoy it? There's a schedule. There's a, there's a schedule. Um, Micro Game Gear and Arcades. Very disappointed, Sega. What? Is this... This is a... 
is this impression that Sega announcements are supposed to be stuff about the IPs that are known in the West? Uh, that's wrong, because Sega is an arcade company. The announcement they're making is actually pretty important, but it wasn't Sega hyping, it was just fucking Famitsu, it's just an anniversary thing, it's pretty good, I think. I don't give a shit about the Micro GG, that's obviously not, it, it to any degree, a, a big part of the announcement, at all. Think about Fog Gaming, whatever it's called, that's the, that's the big deal, though. Uh, this is the first James Pond for me? Yes. Uh, as a kid, I played this on the Amiga. It's my earliest video game memory that I can recall off the top of my head. 